Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. I would want to especially welcome each and every one of you to this virtual CPD event. My name is Samuel Kabneji. I'm a pharmacist and I work with Sevier as a key account manager for Ghana. So today's virtual CPD is on, is on the optimization of the black hypertensive patient who is uncontrolled on amlodipine. And for our facilitator for this afternoon, she's a fellow and a consultant cardiologist at the National Cardiothoracic Center of the Kolebu Teaching Hospital. She's also an adjunct lecturer at the School of Medicine at the University of Health and Allied Sciences at Who. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome Dr. Desiree Dels Ojan to present to us this afternoon. Thank you. Okay, Samuel, thank you very much for your kind introduction. And so today we're just going to discuss a patient, as he already said, who is not well controlled on amlodipine, five milligrams. So it's mainly a clinical case. So it's a patient that I saw at the clinic. So I will just share with you what we find in that patient. So it's a clinical case. So meet Madame Patience Ouso. She's 66 years old. She's a retired teacher. Originally, she's from Kumasi. She was working in Kumasi. And once she retired, she moved to Accra to live with her daughter so that she could help her take care of the children. She has three grandchildren, she said, in the ages of five, eight, and nine. And so she moved to help her daughter take care of the children. Actually, it was a self-referral to our center. You know how Ghana is. The patient realized that her blood pressure was uncontrolled. And so she spoke to her daughter to help her find a doctor in Kolibu. People believe that, oh, the doctors in Kolibu will solve, solve the problem for you. So her daughter is a friend of a surgeon at Kolibu. And so the surgeon contacted me to see this patient on his behalf. So patient came to see us without any referral. And she told me that she has been having very high BPs. She said that she would check her BP and most of the times the BPs are in the 150s. Occasionally the systolic BP may go as high as 160, 163, which she attributes to not sleeping well. She said that she mainly gets the 160s when she doesn't sleep well, but usually it's in the 150s. And she's very compliant on her medication. She has been taking amlodipine 10 milligrams daily. And according to her, she takes her medications religiously. She doesn't miss, and she's very concerned and very scared because she doesn't want to get a stroke. So as we said, her past medical history, she was diagnosed with hypertension about one year ago. No other known diseases. Family history, she said her mother was also diagnosed with hypertension. But the mother was diagnosed in her old age. She was over 70 when she was diagnosed with the hypertension. The mother and had no other known diseases. The mother lived and died around 90 years. She couldn't explain what she died from, but from the history she gave, it looked like the mother passed away from possibly a pneumonia. There's no other chronic diseases in the family. She doesn't smoke. She has never smoked before, and she doesn't drink alcohol. So on physical examination, we saw a well-looking woman. She was very fit, and you can see that she's a woman who takes care of herself. She's not pale, she wasn't jaundiced, and there was no pedal edema. Calculating her BMI from her height and weight, we got a BMI of less than 25, so a normal BMI. The nurses took her vitals and the BP they recorded was 165 over 98 millimeters of mercury with a pulse of 85 beats per minute. Her chest was clear. There was 
know what it sounds and her hand because it, it was the first time we were seeing her we decided to check the bp both on the on the right arm and the left arm on the right arm we had 158 over 95 millimeters of mercury with a pulse rate of 72 beats per minute we checked again and we had 154 over 92 millimeters of mercury with a pulse rate of 72. The left arm was very similar to the right arm. The abdomen was fine, nothing, no abnormalities were detected. And her central nervous system was in a way evaluation of the patient you know whenever a patient comes with hypertension we need to evaluate vascular risk factors we need to identify also if this patient have hypertension induced organ damage what we used to call the target organ damage so that we can classify our patient into high, moderate, or low risk, and decide on the adequate treatment for a patient. So we have in the history, we have done the physical examination, and so. We were now going on to the investigations. And so there are some basic labs that we always request for patients who are hypertensive, especially when we're seeing them for the first time. These labs would help us to identify her risk factors. And so if her full blood count, we will see she we check her renal function, looking for any signs of dyslipidemia. We want to rule out if she's on her HbA1c. We would also do urea, her liver function, and we also did. And then, of course, very important is the ECG. Because she has hypertension that has been not to miss any left ventricular hypertrophy or any strain pattern on the. So we decided we needed to do ECG for her. And so these are the lab results that she brought back to us. As you can see, the full blood count is normal. Her uric acid was normal. The liver was also normal. Her urine showed no signs of proteinuria. It was fine. Renal function was excellent with an EGFR greater than 89. Her TSH was normal. The sugar was 5.1 millimoles per liter. And the cholesterol, as you can see, total cholesterol was a little bit high, and the LDL was also just a little bit elevated. The ECG showed sinus rhythm. The rate was 68. It. The axis was normal and there was no LVH, the low sensitivity. We wanted to be very sure that this patient didn't have left ventricular heart. To be very sure there were no signs of hypertensive heart disease, even if clinically she didn't um, mention any signs or symptoms of heart failure. So we decided to go on and do an echo for her. Her echocardiogram, however, was very normal. There was no LVH. Her EF was very good and she had a great one diastolic dysfunction. So now we need to know for madam patients what target BP do we have for her? We need to let her know what is our aim with the medication, where we want her BP to be so that we can consider it to be normal. Now we have to take this patient as an individual from all the physical examination and the history that we have taken and from the investigations, the results of the investigations, we see that Madam patients 
has hypertension with no other comorbidities. So, according to the WHO 2021 guidelines, patients with hypertension without comorbidities, the target BP treatment goal is a blood pressure of less than 140 over 90 millimeters of mercury. If we use the ESC guidelines for the management of hypertension, they said that in older patients, that is in patients aged greater than 65 years, our patient 66 years, so she falls in that category, it is recommended that the systolic BP should be targeted to a BP range of 130 to 139 millimeters of mercury. So that's where we want a systolic BP less than 140, but maybe above 130, according to the ESC guidelines. And if we use the 2020 International Society of Hypertension, global guidelines on hypertension, they too recommend a target BP of less than 140 over 90 in patients who are greater than or equal to 65 years. And that is based really on whether the patient is able to tolerate that BP. It also depends on how frail the patient is, whether the patient is independent or the patient has to get family support, people to help her and she's not able to move around on her own. So our goal, our target for Madam patients was a blood pressure of less than 140 over 90. millimeters of mercury. And so we gave, we told Madam patient, new medication that we're going to add for her we would know whether her BP is a chap to fill it in or, or, or if she was more comfortable, she could get her own notebook, but record the BPs twice a day for us in the morning before she takes the medication and any time after 4 p.m. in the evening so that we could have a fair idea for low and middle income countries. And that's where we are, Ghana. We are low and middle income countries. The other guidelines, like the ESC guidelines, they pertain mainly for management of hypertension in patients who are living in Europe, who are Europeans. The American... association guidelines adopt it but it is not the best guidelines for us to adopt and so the guideline that is for patients with hypertension used as initial treatment for patients who are diagnosed with hypertension number one we have the diuretics and we are specific to the fireside and fireside like agents number two we have the ACE inhibitors or the ARBs. And number three, we have the long acting dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers, the CCBs. So we could use any one of those drugs 
as initial treatment for patients who are diagnosed with hypertension. And these medications have a very strong recommendation. The WHO also suggests combination therapy. And they suggest the combination therapy, preferably with a single pill combination as the initial treatment for patients with hypertension. And why single pill? Because of adherence and the perseverance on the medication. We know that people do not comply to medication. So if we can give them one pill over two to three pills, then we know that they are more likely to take that single pill rather than giving them two to three tablets to take. And then the combinations that they want us to use. They also want us to use drugs from certain classes for us to combine together. We don't just select any of the antihypertensive drugs. So they recommend combinations of fireside or fireside like diuretics with an ACE inhibitor or an ARB or with a calcium channel block. So again, the same three principal drugs that should be used as initial therapy. Okay. All right. Drugs. These guidelines have drugs that we should prefer for the patient. Again, based on the patient's characteristics. All patients are not the same. So everybody is different. So depending on your ethnic background, depending on your age, depending on your comorbidities, we decide what group of drug would be the best for you. And so we see that diuretics, particularly the fireside and the fireside-like diuretics and CCBs are the drugs that are recommended for patients of African descent. So black patients who are hypertensive, once we diagnose hypertension in these patients, the best drugs to use for them is the fireside and fireside-like diuretics and or calcium channel blockers. Again, this is based on evidence showing that these drugs are very effective in reducing blood pressure in this group of patients. Patients who are over 65 years of age, the first is also, so our patient as we see is black, this is the neon, and our patient is 66 years of age. Hello everyone, um, we apologize for the break in the presentation. We are having challenges with the internet and we are working on fixing this as soon as possible. Just if you have any questions with regards to what has been presented so far, kindly put it in the chat and um, comment and then we will read it and let the facilitator answer to those questions. Thank you. So kindly hold on for us. We will be with you shortly.
Okay, sorry for the break, but we were having some problems with the internet. I hope you can hear me clearly now. All right. So we were talking about the combination therapy. And we said that the WHO suggests combination therapy for patients once they're diagnosed with hypertension. And we should use those combination therapy, preferably with a single pill combination as the initial treatment. Single pill combination to enhance adherence and persistence on the medication. Patients usually are not compliant and so we want to reduce the pill burden by giving them only one tablet if it's possible to control the hypertension. And then they recommend that the antihypertensive medications used in combination should be chosen from three drug classes. That is the fireside or fireside like diuretics, ACE inhibitors or ARBs, and the long acting dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers, the CCBs. The WHO in their 2021 guidelines also have some preferred drugs that they would like to use also. So based on the patient's ethnic background, based on the patient age, based on the presence of comorbidities, we select the antihypertensive group to use to control the BP. And so they recommend that in patients who have African descent, that is black patients, and in elderly patients, that is those over 65 years of age, the best group of drugs to use for these patients are the fireside and fireside-like diuretics and the CCBs. And that is where our patient falls, you know, the patient, our patient is 66 years and she's black, she's a Ghanaian patient. And so to control her BP from using the preferred drugs by the WHO guidelines, fireside or fireside-like diuretics and CCB should be used. Our patient is already on a CCB and so we have to add a second medication. They are suggesting here to us that the fireside or the fireside-like diuretics should be used. If for some reason the patient has some comorbidity, for example, she has some ischemic heart disease, then it would be good to add a beta blocker to her medication. If she was diabetic, if she had had failure, if she had kidney disease, then we would have to add an ACE inhibitor or an ARB to the amlodipine that she's taking. The ESC guidelines also have recommended preferred drugs for black hypertensive patients. And in the guidelines, they have highlighted that the blacks usually respond more effectively to fireside or fireside light diuretics and the calcium channel blockers. These can be used alone or they may be combined with each other. And so there are class one indications for managing black patients with hypertension. They also recommend combination therapy in the form of a single peel and they recommend that the initial antihypertensive treatment should include a diuretic or a CCB. This can be used either in combination with each other or in combination with a RAS blocker. The 2020 ISH Global Guidelines on Hypertension also have some preferred drugs for black hypertensive patients and they mentioned in their guidelines that the black population have a very high risk of developing kidney disease they have a high risk of stroke high risk of heart failure and mortality more than you see in other ethnic groups and therefore it's very important that we get effective control of their blood pressure it's important that we get their bp to target and the first line pharmacological therapy that is recommended to do that for them either as a single peel or in combination they mentioned the drug should include a fireside light diuretic plus a ccb or a ccb 
plus an A or B. So which drug should we add for our patient? We have reviewed the guidelines. Which one should we take? And so based on the guideline, we decided to select a fireside light diuretic for our patient. Remember, our patient is hypertensive, who's already on a CCB, maximum dose of the amlodipine. Still, her blood pressure is not controlled. She has no comorbidities. She's not diabetic. She has no kidney disease. She has no heart disease. She has no left ventricular hypertrophy. So we decided, based on the guidelines, the best drug for her is a fireside light diuretic. And we selected for her indapamide. Why did we select indapamide for our patient? Remember, her BP is still very high. We said that the target BP is less than 140 over 90. And most of the time, her systolic BP is way up in the 150s, sometimes going even as high as the 160s. And so we need a very effective antihypertensive drug to make sure that we get her BP to target. Our patient is scared of getting a stroke. We can't let her get a stroke. We have to manage her effectively so that BP can come down. We have to use a drug that we are sure will bring the BP down. We have to use a drug that is based on evidence. And so we decided to use the interpermide. It's a drug that we have experience with. Well, I have a lot of experience, and I'm sure most of you listening to me have used indepamide before and can also agree that it is a very effective, a very potent antihypertensive drug. It is able to bring the BP down to normal. Another reason why we decided to use indepamide because guideline recommended. We showed you earlier WHO guideline, the preferred drug for blacks who are also elderly so we decided to use it that's another reason and another reason why we decided is that is because it's an ideal antihypertensive for our patient our patient beside being black and over 65 years of age she has no comorbidities as we said she's not hypertensive she's not diabetic she has no chronic kidney disease, she has no proteinuria, no ischemic heart disease, no um, heart failure. So it's a very good drug for her. She has very good renal function. Her EGFR was greater than 89. She's not obese. She has a normal, a normal body mass index. And she has no left ventricular hypertrophy. We confirmed that via echo. And so it is the ideal antihypertensive medication for our patient. Now you may ask me, why not another fireside or fireside like diuretics? And readily available in Ghana, we have Benjo readily available. We have hydrochlorothiazide present. We have clothalidone, which nowadays is not readily available. It has now become scarce on the market. And then we have faithful old indepamide. And we know that these are very effective medication in preventing cardiovascular morbidities and mortalities as confirmed by many random clinical trials and meta-analysis. And so we decided to choose indepamide out of these fireside and fireside-like diuretics. Why, as we said earlier, because it's a very potent antihypertensive drug with which we have a lot of experience. It has a long duration of action and therefore it is able to achieve very good 24 hour BP control. We want a drug that the patients will comply on. The patients will not get tired of taking it. You know, some patients start taking the medications nicely and after about a few months they get tired and they stop but we know bp medications is for life and so we want a drug that they will only take once a day and we want one therefore that will cover or control the bp over 24 hours and so we will show and we are sure that indepamide is able to do that we know that the fireside and the fireside like diuretics have a lot of adverse effects 
They cause electrolyte abnormalities. They can cause dyslipidemia. They can also cause glucose to go high. So they have a lot of metabolic side effects. And so with our experience with indepamide, we know that it causes minimal adverse effects. Most of the patients who I have on indepamide, the side effect that probably they complain about is hypokalemia. And this we see mainly when they do lab tests, because most of the patients do not even have clinical symptoms of the hypokalemia. And this hypokalemia can easily be managed with these patients just by diet, increasing their potassium intake. In Ghana, we have a lot of bananas readily available. Most patients like bananas. So if there's no contraindication and the potassium is a little bit low, then we can easily manage that with diet. The other side effects of the thiazide and thiazide-like diuretics are rarely seen with endopamide. And so we decided to put Madame Patient Souls one in Depamide also because it's really readily available in Ghana and relatively economical. We know that she's now retired. Her daughter is taking care of her with these hard economic times. In the, the price of indepamide is not bad at all for a potent, long-acting antihypertensive. So we saw it as the best drug for madam patients also. And with that medication, she got good BP control. Thank you very much for your attention. Hello everyone, um, Dr. Mrs. John, thank you so much for this insightful presentation. Please, um, if you have any questions, kindly put it in the chat box. We've not seen any questions so far, but there's going to be a short presentation um, by Sabie, and then we can take uh, we can take your questions and then respond to them. So kindly hold on. Okay, so we'll respond to all your questions after this short presentation. And so thank you so much for your time and your patience. As I mentioned, my name is Samuel Kabneja. I'm a pharmacist and I work with Sevier as a key account manager. So I'm just I'm going to do a short presentation on the place of the endapamide family in the management of hypertension. Okay, so we know in this part of the world, um, salt intake is a problem. Okay, the WHO recommends that we reduce our salt intake to less than one teaspoon in a day. I'm sure you are wondering how practical this is. Looking at our breakfast, our lunch, our supper, even our roadside food, we can't seem to control this amount of salt that we take. And as you already know, high salt intake would mean high salt retention, which in effect, affects our blood pressure. This is, this is very important also for your hypertensive patients. You may be doing your very best in managing their hypertension, but then if they still do not adhere to this simple lifestyle modification of reducing their salt intake, they may still come back to your clinic with high blood pressure values. So what then is a solution? So that's why the recommendation for a diuretic is very important for your black hypertensives because of our salt sensitive genes as blacks and because of our high salt intake.
But then when it, when it comes to diuretics, as you are already aware, they come with their various side effects. Okay, so to the patient, one of the main concerns is the increase in the frequency of urination and even the erectile dysfunction. At, um, erectile dysfunction. Realize that your patients will come back telling you that they can't sleep at night because of this um, this effect, which will make them non-compliant. And to you, the doctor, one of your main concerns is you predisposing your patients to hyperglycemia, this like this epidemia, with the long-term use of diuretics. And then to even make matters worse, next slide. That there are recent concerns on the use of hydrochlorothiazide like globally. In 2019, the Ghana FDA issued, um, should I say, a warning to all companies that have hydrochlorothiazide as part of their preparation to update their patient information leaflets to include this concern that there could be a risk of skin cancer. But this is no way to attack hydrochlorothiazide. But just to let you know that, first of all, diuretics are very important when it comes to managing a hypertensive patient's especially the black hypertensive patients. Secondly, diuretics may come with their various side effects, although they are very important in the, in the management, but you can't overlook the side effects. But the question remains, are all diuretics the same? Certainly not. So the differentiating the thousands. And one of them is the British Hypertension Guideline, the NICE Guideline, the most recent edition, which says that if a diuretic treatment is to be initiated or changed, offer a thiazide-like diuretic, such as in dapamide, in preference to the conventional thiazide, such as bendro or hydrochlorothiazide. This is very important for us to note. The European Society of Hypertension, the most recent guideline, also agree with their NICE guideline. And they say that endapamide has been used in a number of randomized control trials, showing number one, cardiovascular benefits. And these agents are more potent per milligram than hydrochlorothiazide in lowering blood pressure, with a longer duration of action compared with hydrochlorothiazide, and no evidence of a greater incidence of side effects. It goes on to say that lower, low dose Thazar like diuretics, such as in dapamide, have more evidence in cardiovascular events with a decrease in mortality compared to the low dose Thazar diuretics. So it's very clear that guidelines are very particular that the Thazar like diuretics are more preferred over the conventional Thazar, such as Bendro and Hydrochlorothazar. In my subsequent presentation, in my subsequent slides, I'll just show you why. And lastly, the GNC8, which is still in use. Also make mention that for black hypertension, you should initiate the thousand like diuretic for these patients. So as I already mentioned, and as Dr. Messenger mentioned earlier on, why do you need to select a thousand like diuretic? They are more recommended for our population, and the more data exists to differentiate the thousand like from the thousand And mortality results are amazing, like diuretics. And the benefit ratio is also in favor of the thousand like diuretic. So um, the question is, which of your patients can benefit from a thousand like diuretic? So your hypertensive patient who needs monotherapy, such as this young gentleman on the screen. For such patients, you can recommend or prescribe naturalist SR, which is a thousand like diuretic for these patients. So naturalist SR blood pressure, which is superior to any other monotherapy. So this was seen in a meta-analysis called the Buggy, which involved about 10,000 patients and had 80 different clinical trials, which were assessed two months it was found that in dapamide nationalist sr one tablet daily gave a further blood pressure reduction of about 22 millimeter of mercury which was superior to the other monotherapies in their initiation doses
Secondly, when it comes to cardio protection, in dapamide protects your patients effectively from stroke. So this was seen in the high vet. The high vet is high, um, hypertension in the very elderly trial. This was the first and the largest morbid mortality trial that was done in patients over 80 years of age. They wanted to find out whether there were any benefits or even risk associated with treating these patients. And naturally, so on top of their blood pressure reduction, had a 39% reduction in incidence of fatal stroke compared to the control group. So this shows that even for elderly patients, Naturalix is even of much beneficial to them. So one of the differentiating factors between the thiazide and the thiazide is this important information. When it comes to metabolic neutrality or metabolic disturbances, indapamide is neutral. So in a long-term use, there's not significant changes in the glycemic control of your patients and lipid control of your patients, unlike Bendu and hydroclothazide, which have been shown to have these effects in a long-term use. So that, what does this mean for your patients? Your patients who are pre-diabetic, if you're diabetic patients who need a diuretic, they are better off being on indapamide because it won't cause the changes in their glycemic control, unlike Bendu and hydroclothazide, which I know from your practice, you've seen it, that in a long-term use, it may interfere with the glycemic control of your patients. So this is very important when it comes to safety for naturalist SR. So all this is as a result of the unique mode of action of naturalist. So first of all, naturalist is like hypophilic. So this means that it has a much pronounced effect in the, in the vessels where it increases the release of prostaglandins, which will cause vessel relaxation, which will reduce peripheral resistance and reduce blood pressure. So about 95% of its action is vascular. So just about 5% of its action is renal, where it's, um, it's, it is a release of, it's, it inhibits the reabsorption of sodium in the DCT. So unlike Bendu and hydroclothazide, where about 100% of the action is in the DCT as water pills. So this differentiates the two. So realize that with Bendu hydroclothazide, your patients will come back telling you that they are peeing a lot at night, they can't sleep during the day, it interferes with their work. Just because of how it works, mainly renal. But in that mind, it's very unique in this mode of action. 95% vascular, just 5% right now, causing excretion of salt. So what about your patients who need dual therapy? So we've added amlodipine to indapamide as natrixam. So natrixam is very unique because it's the first of its kind, a calcium channel and a direct combination. And not the other direct, a thousand like direct. So as you've already seen from the slides and from the presentation by Dr. And Mrs. John, for blacks, because of our salt intake, high um, um, sodium retention, and because of our arteries, which stay face with age, the recommendation is that for those without comorbidities, first line, usually a calcium channel block and a diuretic. So, this combination is very unique to our population and it's very specific. So, for your patients who need dual therapy for the first time, we have Natrexam 1.55 for these patients, and for your patients all controlled on amlodipine, we have Natrexam 1.510 for this group of patients. And when it comes to efficacy, that exam gives a significant blood pressure drop of up to 50 millimeter mercury drop in the systolic blood pressure of your patients. And this is adapted to the initial blood pressure readings. So this was seen in the efficient study. And even with this study, the dosage that was used was 1.55. So that shows you the efficacy of that exam because of the synergistic effect of indapamide and I'm loading pain. So for your patients who need dual therapy for the first time, we could do 1.55. And then for those who are uncontrolled on amlodipine pain 10, we could do the 1.510 for these patients. And on top of that, there's a further reduction in the incidence of stroke by 23% when you put your patients on natrexam compared to other dual therapy. So remember that with natrexam, you are saving the lives of your patients, not only controlling their blood pressure, you're offering them Excellent cardio protection, saving them some costs in the future. So to conclude, Sevier is offering you, is offering your patients the branded dual therapy of choice at an affordable price. So for your patients who are on control on amlodipine 10 and you require a step up, you can do the naturalism 1.5, 10. And then for those who may require a dual therapy for the first time, you can do the natrexam 
at an affordable cost. And then for those who need monotherapy, as I mentioned earlier, you could do naturalist SR1 tablet daily. So thank you so much for your time and attention. We'll be on standby for questions. Okay, so I can see some questions. This is from Dr. Lawrence Ntua, which will be directed to our facilitator. So um, he's asking, any thoughts about addressing PDA edema, vessel dilatation, <coughs> related so heat, so heat feeling and itchiness, sometimes, with, sometimes noted with amlodipine? Very true. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so it's very true that at times we have those side effects with amlodipine. Unfortunately, it's a very effective drug for BP control, but some patients do experience the side effects. And when it becomes too much, then we may have to change the medication for the patients. Sometimes when we combine those the amlodipine, maybe with an ACE inhibitor, sometimes the pedal edema reduces a bit. At times, you can consider using the Asomex, which is the L type of the amlodipine, but not always does it resolve the problem. So, if the side effects become unbearable, like particularly for females, they get this pedal edema, they can't wear their shoes, they have this itchiness in their feet for two times with the amlodipine then we may have to change the medication for the patient. And maybe then we would have to use then the fireside and the fireside like diuretic, maybe with an ACE inhibitor or an ARB. Unless it is manageable, then we go ahead and leave them on the medication. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. So um, we can take the next question too. So this is from Victoria Adum Efifa. Thank you very much for the presentation. Please, my question is, can indapamide be given to patients below 65 years? Of course it can. Remember, as we saw in the guidelines, it is recommended the drug of choice, the preferred drug for a black patient, especially if that patient has no comorbidities. So it doesn't matter the age, we can use it for any patient. And not only even in black patients, remember in the classes of drugs that we use, even to start as initial therapy, fireside-like diuretics is there. We just mentioned that age of over 65 years, just to let you know it is the preferred drugs for that class of patients. But it can be used at any age, for, at any age, once the patient is hypertensive and we want to control the BP, once there's no contraindications to its use, then it can be given to the patient. Okay, thank you very much for the answer. So this is from Kwesi Ejare. How long can a patient be on a single agent, for example, a CCB with poor blood control before treatment failure can be diagnosed? Well, the patient you shouldn't be so long on the medication. You know the patient, for example, the patient is on the CCB. And that's why we always advise the patients to monitor their BPs at home. Home BP is becoming very relevant these days because some patients, when they get to the hospital, they get frightened or they give you some excuse that they didn't sleep well or they didn't take their medications. And so when we do home BP monitoring, then the patient actually sees the BP values themselves. They themselves get frightened of the BP values. 
and then they, they are more likely to comply to treatment. So the patient, for example, is on the amlodipine. Over one month, he's on the medication. So you give the medication, maybe two weeks when you start, you introduce it. He would be on the medication maybe for two weeks and you'll be monitoring. If after one month of being on the medication, his BPs are still high, then of course we have to come in and add another treatment add another drug to control the BP. Another thing we have to take into consideration also is the value of the BP. So sometimes we may not give the amlodipine as long as two, a whole month before we can say that the drug is not controlling the BP. We see very high BPs. The patient actually has a class, if you see, if you have to classify the BP, the patient is in the second stage hypertension, the systolic BP is more than 160, for example, or the systolic BP is more than 180. Just with these BPs, we know that a single drug therapy is not going to control. No matter how good the amlodipine is, 10 milligrams of amlodipine is not going to control the patient when they have systolic BPs as high as 160 and as high as 180. These patients from the beginning should be on combination therapy. You only will maybe use a single agent, for example, the CCB, when you have BPs lower than that, so less than 160, you can maybe consider. But still, it is recommended to that you use different combinations. And so you decide it's, they have poor control depending on the BP values that they are recording. And also, if the BPs are not too high, then you can wait two weeks to one month before adding another medication. Dr. Mason, um, please, are there any more questions? Okay, so this is from Dr. Gabriel Odoy. He's asking, if your patients cannot tolerate the CCB due to side effects, which is, pre which is preferable as substitutes. Okay, so let me take it again. If your patient cannot tolerate the CCB due to side effect, which is preferable substitute, diuretic or RAS inhibitor? So again, we have to individualize the patients. All patients are not the same. So that's why whenever we have a hypertensive patient, we need to evaluate by taking the history, by doing a physical examination and by investigations. And then we identify the patient's cardiovascular risk. We identify the patient's comorbidities. And based on the comorbidities of the patients, then we decide which is the best medication to start them on. We would always want to use one of the three classes, as we mentioned earlier, the CCB, the diuretic, or a RAS inhibitor, as you mentioned. But again, based on the preferred drug, based on the patient's comorbidities, based on the patient's age, that's what we will use. Most we're in Ghana, and most of the patients that we see are black patients, huh? both African descent patients. So here, the ethnic background doesn't play so much. I mean, we know it is there, and the CCBs and the fireside diuretics are the preferred ones for them. But if the patient has, for example, heart failure associated with it, or the patient has chronic kidney disease, or the patients have diabetes, then we would tune in to use a drug that will control these other comorbidities. And whether we use a single therapy, for example, a RAS inhibitor alone, or a fireside-like diuretic alone, depend now on the BPs that the patient are presenting with. So it will depend whether we use combination. And a lot of the times we're always recommending for these patients that we use combination therapy. So we may need to combine the diuretic with the RAS inhibitor. But if the patient has chronic kidney disease and a very low EGFR, then the diuretics, the fireside and fireside like diuretics would not work in that case. And so we would have to maybe use the RAS inhibitors. Or if the patient has ischemic heart disease, an angina patient, and 
you would have to add beta blocker to maybe a RAS inhibitor in that case. So it all depends on the comorbidities of the patient, which antihypertensive you select for them. Okay, thank you so much, Doc. Um, I think it's very, very clear. So Dr. Charles, Uncle Anderson is asking, what's the current selling price of Naturalix and Natrixam? So Naturalix 1.5, Naturalix SR 1.5 milligram sells at 90 CDs for a month supply, three tablets. And then the 1.5, the Naturalixam 1.5, 10 sells at 130. And the Naturalixam 1.55 sells at 120 CDs for a month supply of 30 tablets. Thank you. Okay, so this runs this from runs for Bethy Boatin. What is the safety profile of indapamide in pregnant patients? So again, pregnant patients have medications that are preferred actually. So we want to use a medication that will not affect the baby. We want to use a medication that has been used for a very long time. We want to use evidence-based medication. And so we want to use medications that have been proven to be safe and effective in pregnant patients. And indepamide is not the principal drug for hypertension control in pregnant patients. Once the patients are pregnant, then we know we have safer drugs that we can use for them. So we have drugs like the Aldomets that is around for many, 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 many years that has been studied, has been proven, and has been shown to be very safe for patients who are pregnant. It has been shown to be very effective. So we want to use those first line drugs rather than using a drug such as indepamide in the pregnant patients. So Aldomet is there, labetalone is also good for the patients, nifedipine is also very good. So we would prefer use these drugs for pregnant patients rather than using indepamide. If they were on indepamide before getting pregnant, then we would change them to those medications that have been shown to be safe and effective for controlling BP in pregnant patients. Okay, thank you so much. So this is from Dr. Christopher Mama Aqua. Say so thank you, Dr. Jan, for the lovely presentation. Please, I want to know if your patient, if your patient's previous antihypertensives were all redone abruptly, and in that my introduced or. Oh, I am not trying really to get the rest of the of the question. The question. Or it was tapered down to get in dapamide to take over. Okay, so in our patient, we did not withdraw the amlodipine. So she was already on the amlodipine 10 milligrams. She had no side effects with the amlodipine. The amlodipine was not able to control the BP. It was not able to get her blood pressure to target. So we did not withdraw the amlodipine. She continued on the amlodipine and we rather added the indepamide to the medication. So we put her on two medications rather than one. Uh, we combined for her in a single tablet, and, but really two medications instead of one. Because the amlodipine we know is very potent and it is indicated and there was no reason to take it off. Okay, thank you. So this is from Dr. Francisca Champon. If your patients develop this this glycemia from using indapamide, what can you what can you do about it as a doctor? Do you stop the indapamide and start a different antihypertensive agent, or you start the patient on an anti-diabetic medication? That's her question. Okay, so we know that indepamide is not one of the thiazide-like diuretic that causes a lot of um, metabolic imbalances. So usually it doesn't affect the glucose control as much as maybe the benzoyl, for example. 
So we really would have to investigate this patient clearly to see whether this increase in the sugar is coming from the indapamide or the patient herself is developing the diabetes. So we have to look at it closely and see because very likely it's not coming from as a result of the indapamide. It's very likely the patient is becoming diabetic. It may be the patient is gaining too much weight, you know. Nowadays, people, obesity is the trend. It, it's becoming so much in Ghana, especially among the females. And you know, with the obesity, then goes diabetes comes with that. So we have to look at it, investigate closely to see the cause where the diabetes is coming from and advise our patient. If the blood pressure is well controlled on the indapamide and the patient has no other side effects on it, I would not be so quick to discontinue the indapamide. I would rather, depending on the sugar that we're getting, I would rather recommend maybe starting with lifestyle changes for the patient. She may be, need to lose some weight. She may need to exercise. You know, we don't exercise. We are always very busy. So we, a lot of us, we don't exercise. So I would first go this way rather than discontinuing the medication, the indepamide. Okay, thank you so much. So this is from Dr. John Chika. Any benefit of indepamide vis-a-vis erectile dysfunction or PDA edema? Okay, so we know that the indepamide can also give rise to some erectile dysfunction. And this is really a big thing, especially for the males. So if the patient is complaining of erectile dysfunction, again, we have to be very careful to investigate and explain to the patient so that we are sure what is causing the erectile dysfunction. Some of these patients have the metabolic syndrome. Some of them are already diabetic. Some of them have this long, uncontrolled hypertension before they started becoming compliant on their medication. And so the erectile dysfunction may not, is not always caused by the medication. So that's the first thing we need to explain to the patient. But if after investigating, you're convinced that it's the indepamide causing erectile dysfunction, then you can always change the medication for the patient, give them something that will is better tolerated, or depending on the patient's characteristics, you know, you have to do echo, make sure there's no ischemia, then you can recommend maybe even some medications to enhance the erectile dysfunction. But you have to look at it very closely huh? and wear it, wait to be sure where this erectile dysfunction is coming from. Some of these patients, you also need to advise them that what will kill them is not the erectile dysfunction, but the BP going extremely high and they're getting a stroke. So you need to do a lot of talking to your patients, sit down and explain to them before you decide on withdrawing the indepamide or replacing it. And in terms of the pedalipema, maybe you were referring to amlodipine. I'm not too sure because you don't really get pedalipema with the indepamide. Right, Dr. John, thank you so much. So, yeah, as you rightly said, with indepamide, um, no pedalipema. And even with the, with the erectile dysfunction, if it should happen, unfortunately, it's a pharmacovigilance case, which any of the severe reps come around and when there's such an incident, we report it to the FDA because it shouldn't occur or it's very rare. So it's like a pharmacovigilance issue. But that even differentiates in dapamide from the, the conventional thiazide, such as bendo and hydrochlorothiazide. Those may be known to cause those effects. Okay, but in dapamide, because of this unique mode of action, generally, it shouldn't have that effect. As Dr. Jan rightly mentioned, there may be other causes. So, you could also do well to um, investigate if there's a metabolic syndrome or other factors causing the erectile dysfunction. Thank you. So next question. Okay, I don't think there are any more questions. But then, um, please, we should take note of this important announcement. Um, 
the post test is ready the moment the event ends so kindly enroll um, and then do the post test before you can claim your cpd points it's very important else you'll not be able to claim your cpd points so please wait and then do your post test and it will be posted immediately after this event ends just click on it and then complete the post test to claim your cpd point um please if there are not any more questions i would like to thank everyone for your patience for your attention and for following through to this cpd I want to thank CES for um, your continuous support and collaboration. I want to thank um, Dr. Desiree Delsojan for your time, for your insightfulness, for your wonderful and lovely presentation. She was very clear. We hope to engage you the more in future to be of benefits to the entire medical field. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And have a lovely weekend, everyone. A lovely evening everyone <laughs> sorry and then see you in the next severe cpd presentation and don't forget to recommend natrilex for your hypertensive patients who need monotherapy and the natrix exam which is the first of this kind a calcium channel blocker with a thousand like diuretic either 1.55 for your new patients who need dual therapy for the first time who don't have any other comorbidity and then natrixam 1.510 for your hypertensive patients who are on ablodipine 10 but not well controlled and you're going to step up and all this comes at a very affordable cost thank you so much and see you soon mm -hmm.